Um, yeah, okay, so we're going to be talking about the emissions, uh, the emissions from produced water ponds. Um, just by way of introduction, and maybe, I hope this is uh, new information to a lot of you. If you go out there and, and drill a well, hoping to find oil and, uh, oil and natural gas, uh, there's also a third phase down there that always comes up. There's an aqueous phase down there uh, with the oil and gas phases, and all three of those phases always come up when you drill the well and, and when you produce from the well. The, uh, all three phases go into a device called a separator. It's just a gravimetric, it performs a gravimetric separation of those three phases. As everybody knows, the oil and gas phases, we can sell those on the market for money. But this third phase that comes out, that we call produced water because it was produced in the wells, is really a liability if you're an oil or gas company. It's been in contact with the other two phases over geologic time scales, so it's not clean. You can't dump it in the river, and so you have to figure out something to do with it. And to give you an idea of scale, at least in the Uinta Basin, uh, barrel for barrel, there are about five barrels of produced water that come up for every barrel of oil. Uh, the national average is probably about twice that high. Um, it turns out that in the Uinta Basin, about 95% of that produced water gets re-injected. It's either for the purpose of uh, just disposal of the produced water, gets re-injected into old uh, oil or gas wells, or another, another purpose is to repressurize older formations to try and push more oil or gas out. Um, so like I said, 95% goes back into the ground, but then the remaining 5% goes to produced water ponds for the purposes of mainly just to let, the wa let that produced water evaporate. It's, maybe it's not as bad as it looks, at least those ponds are lined with a, with a heavy plastic liner so that you can prevent contamination of groundwater or the soil. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's, a, it's an environmental problem. The produced water is often saline, and it, because it's been in contact over geologic time with these hydrocarbons, it carries dissolved or suspended um, hydrocarbons. Uh, we all say that oil and gas don't mix, but they really do a little bit, and enough comes up with the produced water that it's, a, that it's an environmental problem. Also, at least prior to the work that we did, there have been very few measurements of, emission, of emissions from these ponds, and they've been overlooked in all of the, all of the major emissions inventories. Um, we looked at a set of ponds in, three, in four different basins that you can see on the map here. Uh, we measured emissions of many aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbons, um, also some alcohols and some carbonyls. And this study lasted over several years and involved sampling in all four seasons. So we have a good database of the, of the emissions from these ponds. Um, the techniques that we used, we combined a dynamic flux chamber, you can see it just out there floating on the water, um, with inverse plume modeling in some cases. And because it's important to know also what's in the water that we're, when we're measuring emissions, uh, it al we also conducted concurrent co-located sampling of water in the ponds, uh, of the concentrations of all the same compounds in the, uh, in the ponds. Um, this diagram just shows the sort of typical layout of a facility like this. The trucks. The trucks come and deliver the water, usually to, to a skim pond. It's relatively small, and there's enough gravimetric um, demixing that occurs there in the skim pond that they can skim off more oil and sell it. Then the remaining water usually goes into what we're calling an active pond. Uh, and then when that's full, or, or just as things evaporate, then the water might be pumped into, in, into other ponds. We wish we had a lot of data on exactly when the water arrives and, and things like that, but we don't. We basically assume that these active ponds that are actively receiving new water, that, that has new water, new, new additions of, of, of uh, produced water, 
and, and that the, the water that's in these inactive ponds for, um, that are receiving water from the active ponds, that, uh, that, that that's older water that's been in the facility for a while. Um, <coughs> this is just an aerial shot of what, of what one of these looks like from the air. I think this particular facility is in the process of being phased out. Um, and I picked one that's not in our study. This one, this one is near Rifle, Colorado. We have uh, ag agreements with some of, the, uh, some of the owners not to disclose any, any, any information about who knows, about who owns which pond that we studied. We decided the best, I decided the best way to avoid any problems was to just show a pond that's not part of our study. Um, but you can see the different, uh, the different um, uh, ponds that are part of this facility. I think this one's in the uh, process of being closed out. So, for example, uh, on an image I saw five years ago, this was an inlet. This was a skim pond right here. You can see it's, you can see it's been filled in. And I think, I think that, that, this, uh, that this facility is in the process of being, of being closed out. Um, so, like I said, we measured emissions from the pond water. Um, one of the things that we find is that they're pretty reasonably good, co uh, reasonably good correlations from within the hydrocarbons. So this shows, for example, methyl cyclohexane versus n-heptane. Um, and this correlation is extending over about seven orders of magnitude. Each grid on each one of these diagrams is an order of magnitude. Um, but the correlations are not good uh, between alkanes and CO2, or between, say, total alcohol and total alkanes. Um, if I back up to this diagram, we've observed hydrocarbons, methanol, and CO2 coming out of the ponds. Um, we also did a principal component analysis of the, uh, of the data, and uh, the emissions seem to seem to divide seem to divide into three separate components. Uh, the light hydrocarbons; these are the those are the green um, the green bars are in one component. Heavy hydrocarbons are in the uh, are in another component. Then methanol is in a is in a class of its own, not correlated well with any with either either of the other, well with any of the other. Um, emissions and the way we the way we interpret these results this is what I think is the most likely interpretation anyway that all of the high hydrocarbons are coming from a single source but the lighter hydrocarbons flash more quickly so we see them in the newer water but not in the older ponds and that um, below about C6 to C8 um, that the green bars are flashing more quickly, evaporating more quickly because they're lighter and, and more volatile. Um, we're pretty certain that methanol has an independent source in these ponds. Um, some of you may know that methanol is used in the natural gas industry to suppress the formation of methyl hydrates. They call it a, 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 an antifreeze. Um, chemically, what's happening is a little bit more complex, but these methyl Methyl hydrates are a solid form of, of, um, of methane and water that clog up the pipes, and, and uh, the methanol suppresses the formation of those hydrates. Um, and so we think that methanol is also being dumped in the ponds independently of, of, uh, of the produced water. Um, and then, and I'll show you some more, infor some more data on this, but CO2, we think, is the final oxidation state. So the age is actually a, a confounding factor that any of the hyd hydrocarbons that remain for a long time in the pond are, are eventually oxidized to CO2. And, and that's why the CO2 does not, uh, we, we, haven't, we haven't correlated the data with age, so CO2 doesn't appear to be correlated with the other compounds. Um, I want to talk about a, a couple of objectives that we had. One of those was to just be able to predict the flux of a species from a set of relevant variables. Um, 
This is probably an incomplete list of the variables that, that might influence the, uh, the emission from a pond like this. Um, we're interpreting in terms of the so-called mass transfer law, which says that the flux of a compound is proportional to its concentration in the water. And obviously that makes a lot of sense. If you double the amount of methanol in the water, then the emission into the air will also double the flux into the air. Um, and so the dependence on concentration is, enters right here. And the dependence on all of the other variables enters into this so-called mass transfer coefficient. So one of the challenges is to estimate these mass transfer coefficients or these proportionality constants from all of the other properties uh, of, of the compounds. One tool that we've looked at a lot is so -called, the so-called water nine tool. It's used in, uh, for example, for predicting emissions from wastewater treatment plants. And, and, and we've examined whether or not it's also appropriate to these, uh, to these produced water ponds. Um, the clock's running out, but along, well, to make a long story short, Water 9 is consistent with our data to within about an order of magnitude. But we've, I've just noticed there's a molecular weight bias. So Water 9 was, was calibrated using diethyl ether. And I've, we've noticed that all of the compounds lighter than diethyl ether um, are underpredicted by Water 9, and all of the compounds heavier than diethyl ether are overpredicted by Water 9. So, so they've got the molecular weight dependence wrong in, in, that, in that model. And I'm not sure why. We're, that's something we hope to, to be able to look at further as time goes on. Uh, the other objective we wanted to look at is how the pond emissions compare with other emission sources in the Uinta Basin. Like I mentioned, these ponds have not been included in any, any, of, the major, um, in any of the major emissions inventories. Um, this table shows the fluxes, the average, or median fluxes, I guess, or average or something, uh, that we measured over all of, the, all of this extensive data set. Notice that there are, lot, there are lots, high fluxes from the skim ponds and also relatively high fluxes from the active ponds. The only thing that's fluxing out of the inactive ponds, the only thing is CO2. Um, the point being that Hydrocarbons, when they first arrive, they flush quickly, and any that remain are eventually, uh, are eventually oxidized to CO2 before they come out. Um, I think, I mean, one way of explaining the data is that the ponds are stratified, that there's a deep, the, the lower layers, there's a deep carbon sink that has a long residence time, and that's why even in old water that's several years old, we can still see CO2 coming out. Um, this table shows the annual basin-wide emissions. Um, the total CO2 is quite large. Uh, the total alcohols are about 5,000 tons per year. And obviously, th th there's a lot of uncertainty in these results because, um, well, we didn't measure every emission from every pond, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty just based on all of the variability that's present in the, in the data. But we're predicting that there are about 5,000 tons per year of methanol coming from the Uinta Basin ponds and 7,000 tons, tons per year of non-methane um, non -methane organics. Um, if you compare that with emissions inventories, as I said, that have omitted the pond, emissions from the ponds, we get numbers like this. And uh, let me, let me apologize to all of the UDAC people who are present here. This is an, I used a preliminary number that uh, Patrick Berkman gave me maybe two or three, one or two years ago. But in any case, the emissions from the ponds seem to be on the order of maybe around 10% of the total VOC budget in the Uinta Basin. And let me just, well, so a couple of conclusions. Water 9 is good to within about an order of magnitude, but there's this molecular weight bias that we don't understand. Um, and the Uinta Basin ponds are significant sources of methanol and VOC. And I thank you for your attention. Well, let me, let me also thank the, uh, thank the sponsors. Thank you.